And that organelle is called mitochondria. And that mitochondria has a very complex structure. Looks kind of like this. And when oxygen comes in here, and fats or sugar or proteins go in there, it can strip the energy off that food and make ATP. A healthy cell has about 2,000 mitochondria, unless it's a heart cell or a retinal cell, because these guys make these guys have energy requirements that are really high. In that case, they have like 10 to 20,000 mitochondria per cell. And guess which cell in the body, or which organ in the body, has the most highest number of mitochondria per cell? Which? Brain. No. Brain. Human egg. 100,000 mitochondria per cell. Human egg. An ova. You know what, what's released from a an ovary every other month by a, a, a female who's in who's you know who's in reproductive age because when that thing has like lots of work to do like build a body out of out of, this, out of the, the join between the sperm and the egg so that's got the most how many mitochondria does someone have if they're hypothyroid maybe only two to five hundred per cell. Hypo? Hypo. Low thyroid. The thyroid hormone's job in the body is to make sure that each cell has enough mitochondria and that the mitochondria are working adequately. That's what thyroid hormones do. We know that the incidence of cancer in hypothyroid people is way higher. And the incidence of heart disease is way higher in people who are hypothyroid. About 60% of, at least of the female population walking around is actually hypothyroid. If you have dry skin, dry hair, constipation, cold hands, not enough energy, the chances that you're hypothyroid are very, very high. Now, on the blood test that the doctor uses to check for are you hypothyroid, the number that's usually looked at is called DSH. It's a brain hormone that stimulates the thyroid. The average normal is between 0.5 and 4.5. Do you know where they get the normals? It's the last thousand people that got the test. No screening. They're not healthy, active, eating well, normal. They're not. They might be on six medicines. They might be, you know, they might be very sick. They might have a lot of bad habits. And so this is a very wide range. And for most doctors, if you go in there and they say, well, your TSH is three, well, you're normal. Mm -hmm. And the patient says to the doctor, but I'm really tired and I'm cold all the time and I'm constipated and my skin is dry and my eyebrows are thinning on the side and my periods are messed up. Well, not thyroid, you're normal. We know that Anything above 1.5, because the lower, the lower on this one, the better. You're hypothyroid. And if you don't have thyroid, you don't have enough mitochondria. Because you might only have 500 per cell and you should have 2,000 per cell. So now those cells in your body are gonna have not enough ATP. And that's why you're tired. And that's why all the rest of the symptoms occur and why you're cold. A lot of what happens in a cell is heat creation so that we can stay warm. And if there's not enough mitochondria, there's not enough heat creation, and then you're cold all the time. Or you have to always have a sweater on when everybody else is comfortable. And so these are things which factor into this, which are really important. So if this mitochondria, let's assume that the thyroid is fine, it's normal, and you have enough mitochondria per cell, that if the mitochondria, if the mitochondria can't make ATP out of oxygen and food, 
then you also won't have enough energy. And 99.9% .9 of the causes of cancer are things that poison mitochondria so they can't make energy. So anything that you look at, from toxins to radiation to chemicals to pesticides to heavy metals, these are all poisons, and they come into our body through breathing, through skin contact, through, through food. I saw somebody today, she's like 99% organic. We, we did a test on her, which is, it, it, it looks for about uh, 25 categories of environmental toxins. And her pesticides were really low, and her plastics were really low, and she's really careful but she had super high levels, like hundreds of times what would be acceptable of a lot of things that are found in, in uh, high-end cosmetics and hair and beauty products. And they were really high. And that's the only thing we could come down to, but she didn't have any other bad habits. She came in with severe fatigue. And when we got the test back, I was like, look, where is this coming from? Well, they filter their water and they filter their shower water, and she's 99% organic. I mean, she's really good, she's really careful. I said, what about personal care products? Do you, do you, do you, are you careful? And she said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> These chemicals are in there. And the rule on a, on, a, on a cosmetic or hair product is, if you can eat it, you can put it on your skin, because it, put it on your skin is as good as eating it. Okay? So, you want to moisturize yourself with coconut oil, you can eat that, it would be fine. Yeah. But if you look at the ingredients on some of these things, which have a very long list of who knows what they are, uh, they might work on a superficial level, but they don't actually work very well inside. And they go into mitochondria and they poison stuff, because this is very, this is like super delicate thing. And when the mitochondria don't work in a cell, that cell can't make energy. And the cell is programmed when that happens to kill itself. There's a genetic program which says, kill yourself if, if you're poisoned. And sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes the kill yourself thing is also turned off by the same toxins that poison the cell. These are genes, these are genes, these are self-destruct genes, and the genes can get poisoned too, so the cell doesn't kill itself. And what the cell does instead is it gets the same signals that an embryo gets when first implanted. Get me blood vessels, get me things that will help me grow, protect me so that my mother doesn't realize that I am a foreign organism living inside of her. Because normally, you know, fetus isn't the mom, it's the combo, and it's foreign tissue. And if you tried to take some tissue from a baby and plant it in the mother, the mother would reject it. So there is a mechanism genetically to put a special coat and some special chemicals around that thing so that the immune system doesn't see it as foreign. Then the normal surveillance of your immune system, which is looking for these, these rogue mitochondrial cells, to get them, misses them. And then that cell, what it does, so here we have a cell, I'm gonna call this C, cancer cell. And the cancer cell doesn't have mitochondria that are workable enough to produce ATP, and it has to do ATP from a primitive, mechanism which is called anaerobic metabolism which means no oxygen so food comes in no oxygen comes in the cell has a way without mitochondria to make energy but a healthy cell going this way makes 36 ATPs which is what it needs and the cell going this way only makes two ATPs and it can't actually live on that, it's too little. And so it gets this stimulus to, it's got this stimulus to survive, okay? It wants to survive. It turns on these genes, which can be called cancer genes, but they're not really cancer genes, they're just survival genes. They're genes that worked in the embryo, in the fetus, 
to create enough blood vessels and enough organ growing stuff so that that thing could make it. And one of the major things that it does is it takes the door, there's a door on the cell where food comes in, and it says, I need more doors because I have to get in more food. And in the terms of the cancer cell, the only food that it can eat is glucose or an amino acid called glutamine. Mm -hmm. Those are the two foods that a cancer cell can eat. And it makes more doors. And an average cancer cell has 10 times the doors than a healthy cell does. And if that cancer cell has enough glu glucose, sugar, or glutamine, it's an amino acid, it can get 10 times the food in, and it can make 10 times the AP ATP. And now it can live. We don't want it to. But this is what happens. So I'm just sort of backing this up. But why does this happen? What happens with this? So we can have a breakdown where the mitochondria gets poisoned. We can also have a breakdown where the cell doesn't self-destruct when it's supposed to. And we can also have a breakdown that if the immune system is overloaded, that it might not notice this guy early enough. And then once a certain time period's passed, he's got his coding. <laughs> so when the immune system sees him, he sees friend instead of foe. He's protected. The tumor produces a, an enzyme called nagalase, and that nagalase blocks the, the anti-tumor cell from getting turned on to eat him. Can you? The, the, the tumor, one of the mechanisms that the tumor uses to protect itself is to produce an enzyme called nagalase. We can measure nagalase levels in people, mm -hmm. and people with cancer have high nagalase levels. Mm -hmm. And we know that when the, when the macrophage, the anti-tumor white blood cell, <coughs> comes close to here, the nagalase hits it, and it doesn't allow it to attack. It actually blocks. In order for the macrophage to work, vitamin D has to bind on the macrophage. That turns on a switch which says, go eat a bad guy. And that nagalase, if this is the receptor for vitamin D, where vitamin D has to dock to turn it on, Nagalase goes like this, vitamin D can't dock. The macrophage can't be turned on. So then the cell can attack the cancer. So we so sometimes the immune system is already overwhelmed. I was just talking to Ginger right before. Uh, because our patients who come in with cancer, and this is the same progress in any serious disease. If you have someone with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or Parkinson's disease or ALS or multiple sclerosis, the same thing is going on. These cell, the cell can't make ATP. And what we find in these people is that many, many, many of them have toxins in their body which are tying up their immune system so that their immune system is so already frozen up with stuff that we'll miss this stuff too. And one of the one of the biggest toxicities that you can have is if you have root canal teeth in your mouth. They're a very big toxicity. And we were just talking earlier, because I send virtually everybody over there to get an x-ray, a special kind of x-ray. It's a CT scan of the jaw. Do you got a root canal teeth? Let's see if you have an abscess there. And it runs about 99%. Almost every root canal we x-ray, there is an abscess. And it's pus under pressure right at the root of the tooth. The tooth is dead, you can't feel it. If Dennis looks at it, he looks at it fine. He does a, a, a two view x-ray and a lot of times the abscess is hidden by the tooth and you don't see it and there's nothing wrong with you. So we find that one of the big things, and there's a very high association with root canal teeth and breast cancer, okay? The breast teeth, the breast in a, in a, in a Chinese medicine model, the breast teeth are stomach meridian. So stomach meridian is thyroid, breast, ovary. And the breast teeth 
are the molars on the top, the two molars, not the wisdom teeth, the two molars on the top and the two premolars on the bottom. And the number of times we see people who have breast cancer that have root canals on those teeth are very high. So these are, these are, I jumped ahead a little bit, but these are things that you get your immune, and, and see, you have an abscess under pressure two inches from your brain, and the nerve that used to connect to that tooth is now cut off, but the nerve is still there, and it's a straight track back to the midbrain. The, the, this, this nerve, this fifth nerve that goes to the brain, it is the most, is the largest nerve coming out of the brain. And the toxins that are manufactured in the root canal, because this is an infected dead tooth, these bacteria are bad and they produce the big time biotoxic waste. And that stuff can track along back to the brain. And if you get an infection in your brain from one of these things, that's really bad. So the body makes a choice. And the choice is we're gonna concentrate immune cells here and we're gonna sacrifice things elsewhere like the breast, or like the prostate, or like the colon, okay, or like the lung. These are the big four cancers, other than skin. And they get away because there's not, if, there, if you have a thousand, let's say, immune cells that are supposed to be all the time, their job is, is there any bad guys? But if you've got root canal teeth, there might be only 500. And 500 is not enough to cover the whole body, and so stuff gets away. So this is really important. So what we have to do if we're trying to prevent cancer is that we have to be aware of this is the kind of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Now just to give you something else which is very interesting. Before I came over tonight, I was, I was looking at the website for the American Cancer Society. Just for fun, I was looking at prevention of cancer and causes of cancer. And what the website said is that you have genetic abnormalities that change the DNA in the cell to turn on cancer genes to make you sick. And it is completely false. It's been known to be false since 1933, when Otto Warburg, a German doctor, discovered that it was sick mitochondria that caused cancer, that these cells were anaerobic, they couldn't make oxygen, they couldn't make energy, and that was the cause of cancer. And he got a Nobel Prize for it. Now, to prove this, this is modern day proof now. To prove this, some researchers trying to answer the question of, is it bad DNA that causes cancer? Or is it bad mitochondria that causes cancer? And those bad mitochondria affect the DNA to make it do things that it shouldn't do. Which way is it? So here's what they did. They did an experiment. They took a cancer cell. And let's just say that this is the nucleus of the cancer cell. This is where the DNA is. And they took the nucleus of the cell and they transplanted it into the nucleus. They're able to remove the nucleus of the healthy cell and put the cancerous cell's DNA in the healthy cell. This is very fine work. Yeah. And then the question was, when this cell divided, would it make two cancerous cells or would it make two healthy cells? And if it's the DNA that causes it, that would prove it. And what do you think happened? Two healthy cells. Two healthy cells. Wow. Now, they did the opposite experiment. They took the cancer cell, and they took the mitochondria, and they put it into a healthy cell, healthy cell, and the daughter cells were cancer cells. This is a mitochondrial disease. Okay. A 
Well, that is not you. This you, you, the American Cancer Society either doesn't know it or doesn't want to think about it or doesn't want to do anything with it. Because this has huge implications for how you would handle someone with cancer. Yeah, for sure. Because if you know that this is the problem, then mitochondrial health is health. And, and, and bad mitochondrial health is illness. Because cancer is just on the far end. So the healthy cell repaired the cancerous DNA, the damage. It didn't, it didn't affect it. It didn't affect it because it isn't where the source of it is. What happens is that the bad mitochondria make the cell, if it doesn't self-destruct, change its DNA so that it makes more receptors for sugar to come in and sends out hormones. We measure in, in people who have cancer a hormone called, you'll recognize this, you know this hormone? HCG. Human chorionic gonadotropin. This is produced by the placenta in order to grow and nurture the baby. It's a growth hormone. And in pregnancy, the HCG levels are like 10,000, 40,000, they're high. And that's how you tell someone's pregnant. If you want to first know they're pregnant, the doctor a week later will get an HCG level of the blood. And if, the fit in the, and if it's real high, you're pregnant. You know, if it's not high, you're not pregnant. So it's done on the urine strips too. It's, it's, a, it's, it's looking for this stuff. But we know the cancer cells make HCG. And we can measure the HCG in the urine and in the, in the, stu in the, in the blood. And we know that if there's active cancer, in many times it's producing HCG, and these levels are high. And when the cancer goes away, the HCG levels start coming down. So the DNA produces things to support the life of a cancer cell, because it doesn't have a functioning mitochondria, and so in order to survive, it's got to do all these things. Follow me? Okay. So mito mitochondrial health is, the, is health. And then all the things that we want to do, or all the things that we're looking at, to try to preserve health are, how is your mitochondria doing? And if you have toxins, or root canal teeth, or bad bacteria in your gut, or nutritional deficiencies, they also affect the mitochondria because the thing needs that to just live. Or you have compromised oxygen delivery. Now, these cancer cells, turns out that they have all these doors where food can come in and glucose and glutamine are their main sources of food and that in someone that we suspect or that has cancer if we can make their diet very low in these two things we can start to starve the cancer cell we can put the cancer cell under high stress because it's got to have these in quantity so if you go to Moffin Hospital tomorrow and you walk in the waiting room of the cancer center, you will find a great big thing of candy and you will talk to the dietitian and they'll say you can eat anything you want as long as you don't lose weight. And ice cream is fine, and cake is fine, and so are candy bars and it doesn't make any difference. And that is 100% true. And if you walk across the street from Moffin Hospital to University of South Florida, the main researcher in the world doing work on low sugar diets for cancer uh, uh, treatment is a guy named Diagostino and he's right across the street and he's showing in you take a breast cancer you transplant it into a rat you give a hundred rats you give half the rats rat chow you give the other half the rats a ketogenic diet a very low carb diet a really low sugar diet and the cancers don't make it in the ketogenic diet and then the rat chow diet, they, they thrive and they grow. So these are things that I think for most people are relevant whether you have diagnosed or cancer or not. If you're on a high sugar diet, whatever these guys you have around, and probably every day in us thousands of times, these things go funny. Because our environment is very full of toxic things. And we're being exposed to it all the time. As careful as you want to be, you're exposed to it all the time. And if we measure this stuff, we find it in everyone. There is a gas additive. It's an octane booster. It's called HTBE. I haven't yet to find anybody who's got really low levels. I think the environment is so saturated with this octane booster that it doesn't matter where you live. I've got people in Kentucky in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of rural Kentucky 
their their levels are are you know I've never seen it normal. <laughs> I've done hundreds of these tests. It's a carcinogen. No carcinogen. And so the environment is full of these things. And I think you try to do as well as you can. Okay. So things like plastics and chemicals and pesticides and heavy metals. These are all carcinogens because they are all mitochondrial toxins. And the more that you can kind of kind of organize your life so that your exposure to these things is minimized as much as you can, your risk is going to go down. Uh, and, and then your chances of getting, you know, being one of these statistics of, 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 of getting cancer goes down. And uh, so that's really important. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So say you have reduction of the mitochondria from hypothyroid or toxins, are they able to get up to the level of 2,000? Yeah, yeah. If you, if you, if I take somebody, and this happens probably three or four times every day, the patient comes in and they have some kind of complaint, which, which I know virtually every complaint is reduced to their mitochondria aren't working somewhere. Okay? They don't feel good, they're tired, they're getting frequent illnesses, they got cancer, they've got MS, they've got Lyme disease, their mitochondria aren't working right. And what I need, what I have to do if they're gonna ever get better is I gotta get their mitochondria working. I've gotta get them detoxified. I gotta get this stuff out. So I've gotta, right now, okay, we're gonna do the best we can to not put any more toxins in. If you don't have a water filter, if you're not filtering your water that you drink and that you shower with, you are exposing yourself. The water in this county has 500 additives and it looks really clear and it tastes not too bad, but it is full of drugs and toxins and pesticides and chemicals and they're getting them. So filters help. And like when you shower, it's as good as drinking. So go to Costco or Best Buy or go on Amazon, and for 30 bucks you can buy at least a shower filter. If you can afford it, get a whole house system where the water is softened so that all the water coming in is treated once, and then underneath your sink get a reverse osmosis system, and that water is treated twice. I don't like the refrigerator carbon systems. I don't think they're good enough. It's better than nothing, but they're not good enough. Reverse osmosis systems aren't that expensive. A couple hundred bucks, you can get one. And at least that part is good. Have you heard of the echo hydrogen water filtration system? Mm, I don't know. Do you know anything about hydrogen water? The hydrogen water is sort of the latest antioxidant. I'm going to call it a fan. I think some people, I never I've tried it three different companies. I've never did anything for me. I tried a, bought a case of it and just gave it away to patients. Tell me if this helped you. And I didn't find anybody that got a big benefit. So I don't, I'm, I'm not a believer at this point. If it's being sold, it's being promoted. H2 water, hydrogen water, it might be fine. I just, there's so much stuff that yeah. Yeah. I just try to figure out, is it, you know, does it make a difference? Is it worth it? You know, is it worth another 30 bucks a month to add this in to the already 10 things that are 30 bucks a month? Yeah. <laughs> like I look at my pills in the morning and it's just like, oh. and then I look at my wife's pills, okay? Supplements. Yeah, supplements. We don't take any drugs. That's not normal. That's the only, it's not even a drug. It's just a hormone. Because it makes a difference if you're low and you're, you should be enough. Now, if you take an average patient who's hypothyroid, what we do is we start giving them a little bit of thyroid. So a normal thyroid makes about 180 to 240 milligrams a day of thyroid hormone. So if you have thyroid cancer, you cut your thyroid out, you need to have thyroid replacement, and that's about what it'll take to get you in some reasonable range. 180 to 240 milligrams of, of thyroid hormone. If, if someone had thyroid cancer, couldn't you probably help them reverse it? Well, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but the way people are treated these days is that if you have, if your thyroid is acting too high or you have thyroid cancer, there's a good chance you're going to get some radioactive iodine in you, which is going to kill your thyroid. But what they don't tell you is, do you know where the other two organs are that have the most iodine receptors? Breast. Breast. Oh. Oh. 
So you're going to radiate your prostate, you're going to radiate your breast, you're going to radiate your ovary while you're radiating your thyroid. Now that makes a lot of sense. It's just like ridiculous. When there's other ways to do it that are better and safer. Because radiation is definitely a carcinogen. You know? If you get a mammogram as suggested every year from the time you're 45, by the time you've had 10 of them, your risk of breast cancer goes up like eight or 10 times. It is a carcinogen. And breast tissue is sensitive to radiation. Well, let's just radiate it. So how do you check to see if you have breast cancer? Then? You get a good exam, you examine yourself, and you go get a thermography every year, which is, which is a, it's a heat image of the breast. Nobody touches you, nobody squeezes you, and it's a heat image. And the problem with mammograms is, is that it's a late indicator. Yeah. A person who's got a positive mammogram has had cancer cells growing for between eight and 10 years. Because the mammogram does not show until the cancer is calcified. A mammogram is an x-ray. And when there's calcium in the breast, that is the trigger that there, there may be cancer there. We know that 20% of the time when there is cancer, when there is um, calcium there, there's no cancer. But you've been poked, you know, you've been biopsied by then uh, because you can't tell the difference. A, a, um, a thermography can detect as few as 250 cancer cells, which is in about a two year range versus an eight to 10 year range. Well, if you have a positive thermography, so look suspicious, heat patterns are abnormal. When, see, when there's cancer, first thing that happens is more blood. Gotta have more sugar. So, more blood vessels, okay? The cancer turns up these hormones. If we look at the genetics of the tumors of the people that we see, and you see that all the things, all the genes that are kicked way up are all the growth factor genes. Endothelial growth factor, blood vessel growth factor, they're all growth factor genes. Because that cell's gotta have a lot of blood because it's gotta get a lot of sugar in it. And so, if the breast is under stress and these things are giving signals of more blood, more blood, more blood, then that breast is gonna get warmer. It's gonna be hotter because there's more blood. Mm -hmm. And the thermography can tell the difference between like a, I don't know, maybe a 10th or 20th of a degree of heat. And so a normal breast is, is relatively cool compared to the rest of the body because it's mostly fat and gland tissue. There isn't a lot of blood vessels and it's off the body. And on a normal, healthy thermogram, it's blue, which is cool. If you get an area that's red or white, that's like whoosh, blood vessels, heat, okay? Then get an ultrasound. Is there something there? Can you, can you feel anything? Maybe, maybe not. Get an ultrasound. Can you see a lump? Is it a cyst? Is there some kind of mass there? Sometimes the ultrasound doesn't give you. We may have to go to like an MRI of the breast, mm -hmm. which is a finer tool. I don't like to be poking needles in breast suspicious things for breast cancer because early on the body walls it off. And if you're going in there with needles, you're poking through the hole, through the, the, the barrier that the body naturally sets up around one of these things, and you're going to let them out. And it's proven that you stick 12 pins through a prostate or through a breast, you are going to spread that tumor. Okay? And then you spread it. So it's it's the so it's it's just it's kind of ridiculous the way it's going. And the thing that is the most disturbing to me is that if you look at the survival rate of breast cancer now versus 1900, it is no better. But the therapy does not work. And there was a very elegant study done in patients that had stage four cancer, not just breast, but general cancer. And half of them, they gave them chemotherapy for their cancer. And the other half of them, they didn't give them chemotherapy. And the difference in survival of the with chemotherapy versus the no chemotherapy was only 2% over five. 
And this was in the Journal of Cancer, 2002. And the editor wrote an editorial, and he said, if we look at cancer, this five-year survival rate of all comers is about 36% survival for five years. We know that chemotherapy is carcinogenic, just like radiation is. Is it worth our while for a 2% improvement in survival to be giving these drugs in the first place? Right. It's completely ignored. Yeah. And so the survival has not changed. And if you look at it, the only thing that's improved survival is lifestyle change. It's diet, it's supplements, it's, it's you know stress reduction, it's good food, it's detoxification. It's the only thing that makes it happen. And now with we know of mitochondrial health is those things are the only things that really affect mitochondrial health too. And so if we can get busy on that stuff, we can we can start to make a difference in survival. Yeah. Good question. And how can today's doctors be allowed to continue their false practice of keeping us well? Because they own the store. Yes. Yeah. They own the regulatory agencies to the pharmaceutical companies and the American Cancer Society, they own the store. And so they can control what research is done, how it's done, what the interpretations are, what the therapy is going to be. And it's only, it's only now with, with, with sort of in, from the internet, because now people can get communication and get information that they could never get before. And then you guys, you get guys like Ty Bollinger and these other guys, which put together panels of doctors who treat these diseases who say, look, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And, um, and the treatments are, they frankly don't make any sense. If you sit down with anyone and you say, okay, here's what the oncologist is going to tell you. Was, it was said best to me by a guy that became a really good friend of mine. He's a medical doctor. He had stage four colon cancer. And it came in. And he said he had gone to the, he had gone to the uh, oncologist because uh, he ran your medical doctor. I'm not particularly health oriented. And he went to the medical doctor and he said, I'm 53 years old and I now have cancer in my colon and I've got metastasis in my liver. And why is it that I lived 53 years and I got it now? And he said, Well, you have a good immune system. You know, your immune system is good, you're protected. He said, Well, you just took me through a scenario where you're going to pretty much take my immune system to an edge where it's going to almost kill me, and then if I make it, you're going to use that as your treatment. How does that make any sense? And it doesn't make any sense. And the guy said, well, that's just how we do it. <laughs> and if you look at it, the people who die under chemotherapy, under high-dose regular chemotherapy, they don't usually die of their cancers. They die of secondary infections because the immune system is gone. Or the tissues get so thin that they rupture their colon and then they get infection from that or some other. So the, the sort of, the, the idea of it is not, it's not rational, it doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's just what we're living under. And, uh, and you don't have to do it that way. And there's a lot of, you know, the, the fear factor of what you get told is just, it's just, that's what it is. It's sales by fear. And people get scared. You get cancer, you get a biopsy, you get a positive thing, you're gonna be scared. And I, what my suggestion is, is that yes, you go see the oncologist. And you just, you just take a couple of weeks and you just do it as a, I'm getting, collecting data. And I'm gonna get the data from them and like, okay, for this cancer, what are you gonna do? What are the statistics of how well are you, am I gonna survive? Doing, with my age and my problems, what are my chances doing what you got? And then you go someplace else, you come to someplace like what we do, and we say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what our statistics are on it. Here's how we handle it. We're trying to do two, we're trying to do two things at once. I know, see, we know, this is another fact that people don't know, and that is that the cancer cell, the mother cell, the stem cell that originated the cancer, the original one, chemotherapy does not kill those cells. So if you have a grape-sized tumor, has a trillion cells in it, and 
let's say you've got the best chemotherapy that's available and you can give it to the person. And it kills 99% of a trillion cells. Who's math in here? We'll just take off two zeros. That's right. Just take off two zeros. You're left with still this. Now your blood counts are low, and now you're getting medicines and blood transfusions because the, the growing cells in your bone marrow, and in your hair, and in your gut, they're getting whacked. They're among the 99% that are getting hit. And you get mouth ulcers and diarrhea, and you know, it's a mess. Okay, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it again, we're gonna transfuse you, we're gonna give you more stuff, and we're gonna do it again. You still have way, 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 way too many. Okay? And we know that the one that started this whole thing isn't killed by it. How, how do they know that? Huh? How do they know that? I mean, what's different because about? most cancers, if you have advanced cancer, it's going to just come back. The cells are still there. We can find them in your blood circulating around. So they're still there. In tissue culture, too. When we do, we do studies where we take the cancer cells out of the blood, we send it to a laboratory that does this. And they challenge those cells with 50 different chemo agents. So they take one, so they take the stem cells, they grow them up, and they put, okay, we're gonna have 100 test tubes with cancer cells, with your cancer cells growing in there. Okay, and then we're gonna give, the first 50, we're gonna give 50 different chemo agents, and we're gonna look at how many of those cells got killed. And the best ones we see are 82%. Sometimes it's zero percent. So you never really get it. So if you can do something where you, the strategies are lower the sugar load, okay? Repair the mitochondria, detoxify so that the mitochondria that are sort of on the edge, sick, not functioning, will come back on. Make more energy. Do a very light kind of a chemotherapy where you don't get poisoned by it. Then do other things like intravenous vitamin C, ozone, you know, herbs, because the other 50 things that they test are herbals or botanicals that have anti-cancer properties that do kill stem cells. And which of those are the best? And then you get a treatment that's about 10 times better than what the regular treatment is because you're working with the body now to not completely take it out but we're gonna take out some because we wanna lower the load and we wanna build it up and give things that will kill the cancer that aren't gonna kill the immune system and the rest of the body. Right. And it gives you a better chance. Okay. It's still longer than perfect, but it's better. And it's humane because the therapy doesn't kill the patient, yeah. which is how it's supposed to be. Go overseas. What? There's people that that leave the United States, go overseas for various types of cancer. Yes, and there are some treatments that you can do overseas that aren't allowed here. One of them is the most ridiculous one known, which is there is a, an apricot pits have a chemical in there called laetrile. Laetrile is an anti-cancer substance. Now, if you put laetrile into the body, uh, it doesn't do anything to healthy cells, but when it gets to a cancer cell, because of the way the cancer cell works, it turns on the laetrile, it activates it. And it's helpful. It's not a panacea, but it's helpful. Mm -hmm. There's only one drug in the Florida statutes that is outlawed. Even marijuana is legal now. But this is the other one that is outlawed under any circumstances, cannot be given by a physician to a patient for no matter what reason. It's laetrile. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So that's it's B17. It's B17, same. Yeah. But so you can buy apricot kernels here at... You can, and you can chew them up, but getting them in your blood's another thing. And how do you dose it, and how much is in that apricot seed? You know, you don't, you don't know. I mean, you can order over the internet Lantrol for IV use, and get it in Mexico or get it in Germany. And But you've got to monitor it, because you can get... Lantrol has arsenic in it, and you, can, you, you have to watch it. That's a problem sometimes with um, trying to do the Thai Bollinger thing. It's there's so much can't do it. information that you can't absorb it. You can't take you it. You can't, and you can't do it because you have no, you, you just have no reference point. No, to back, it. Yeah, no background. Right. 
So let me take a couple questions and then yeah. I can wrap. Yeah. When we were talking about the water filtering, I, I'm using a distiller. Yes. And do you think that's as good as the other type of thing? Is? Well, I think the water's pure. I think it, it, you end up with dead water. Well, that's what I was going to Somebody told me, well, you're not getting metal out of it. I think I'm getting metal out of my vegetable. Right? You are. It's so. fine. Energetically, it's kind of I know why I first started But at least it doesn't have the other stuff in it, yeah. which is good. When I first did that distiller, I ran a couple of days without cleaning it. Believe me, it takes a crap out of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the cracks in there. Do you know that the, the, the main pesticide used in, in agriculture in, in worldwide now is glyphosate, it's, it's Roundup, okay? Now, we, we check for Roundup as part of our toxin screen, and nobody has no Roundup. In fact, three quarters of all the rain samples in the United States, if you collect them, you can measure glyphosate in those levels. Now, glyphosate not only is a poison to insects, it's a poison to the insects in the soil that break down the soil and make minerals and make, make the nutrition available to plants. That's why our plants today have probably 25% of the vitamins and minerals that they did 100 years ago. Because the plants are sick too. They're being poisoned too. And the, and the soil biome is poisoned too. And then you eat that so you get poisoned because glyphosate pokes holes in the intestines. It gives you a leaky gut. It's a neurotoxin and it's a carcinogen. And then you feed a cow, you take a nice cow, and you grow him GMO corn, which is saturated with glyphosate. And then you feed that cow that corn, so now he gets saturated with glyphosate. And then you barbecue him on the grill and you eat that. <laughs> and now you get that yeah. stuff. Yeah. The corn, the GMO corn, the glyphosate, the whole shebang. So if there's something that you can do is watch what you put on your skin, watch what you put in your mouth, Watch what you touch and what you breathe. Not to make you totally paranoid. <laughs> 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 Mine is plastic. Well, the problem with buying water is plastic. It's all in plastic. Yeah. And then you me we measure people in plastics. You know, that thing was on a truck going through uh, Louisiana and he got. He had to stop over that night, and it's 100 degrees, and his trucks aren't refrigerated, and the water's sitting in there, and it's full of plastics. Yeah. And you drink it, and you get plastics. They check the polar bears in Antarctica for plastics, because the polar bears are hypothyroid now, because there's so much plastic stuff and heavy metals, because they're eating all these contaminated fish in their thyroids. And they're full, they're full of this stuff. We are on a big-time self-destruct. So... It's, you just have to try to do as, as, as good as you can. How do you detox glyphosate? Someone is really good. Someone? Yeah. And then making sure that your liver and your gut are up to, you know, that they're detoxifying well. Uh, we use ozone saunas. Ozone's a good detoxifier. Uh, so that helps too. And you can get this stuff down. And then avoid eating it. Like, try to really be organic. I did a... I did a... Uh, made a mistake a couple years ago. We're, we're, our, our house is, is, is pretty, we're pretty organic. We don't eat out a whole lot. And I did this test that, that we were, that we do on everybody else. And my stuff was really good, except my organophosphate pesticides were like really high. And I was like, oh, geez, what is that coming from? And I had gone on, I was eating a, I was going on the Bulletproof diet, it was a couple of years ago, and I was eating a lot of butter, organic butter, you know, carry gold butter. Yeah. And I was eating a lot of macadamia nuts, but they weren't organic. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, God, you else. So I sent the butter and the macadamia nuts to the lab, check it for organic phosphate pesticides, and they were both clean. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wasn't that? What it was is that I had gotten, can I tell this? No, I can't tell this. Anyway, I had eaten a lot of strawberries that were kind of a gift that were not organic. Now they are at the top of the dirty dozen. Um, yeah. okay. And that was the source. Okay. So you stop eating them, then they go away. So. What do you think of a vegan diet? I think it's terrible. Terrible. It, you will just get malnourished. I have tested many hundreds of vegans, and they're all malnourished. They don't have enough protein. They're almost always tired. Give them a couple years. They're tired. 
because our bodies, our, our, our development, our evolution is hunter-gatherer. Right. You know, man, there are, there are species going back about two and a half million years. 99% of that time, you know, from minus two and a half million to about 10,000 years ago, what people ate were what they could find. They were hunter-gatherers. And, and mostly it wasn't fruits and vegetables because if you ever ate, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, we had wild apples, wild crab apples. Well, you're not going to eat too many of those. Yeah, They're pulpy. They don't look very good. They give you a stomach ache. Yeah. And, most, and all the stuff we get now is all hybridized. It's beautiful. It's sweet. It's delicious. But it's all hybridized. It wasn't hybridized. I, they, 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 they mix different species of things to make it shelf life longer, look beautiful, be sweeter. So they can genetically modify these things so that they're, so that they're good. You, you taste a, gold, a, a delicious apple now. It's beautiful, it's red, it's sweet, you know, but that's not what a real apple is like. And so people didn't eat much of that stuff because there wasn't much nutrition, it's mostly pulp and it doesn't taste good and it gives you a stomach ache. So mostly what they were eating is if they were near water, they ate fish, if they were near animals, they ate animals and the parts of animals. And, and genetically wise, that went on for 2,499,000 years. Nine, 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 9,000 years. And for 10,000 years, things switched. People became farmers, they did grains, they, they domesticated animals, they got dairy, and they started eating those things. But genetically, most of us do better on these other foods. And vegans, there's no long-term vegan populations in the history of the planet. They just don't do it. So my experience was, is that it just isn't good enough nutrition. So you, need you just uh, straight organic? Straight organic. Straight organic. With animal proteins. Organic animal proteins. Huh? Organic animal proteins. Yeah. 